Good morning. Um, we'll start uh, with a few words about uh, the great Gadol that passed away uh, on Friday. On Shushan Purim, Rav Chaim Kanievsky, Zecher Tzadik V'Kadosh Livracha. Yesterday was his funeral. Uh, quite awesome, uh, as for as was for other Gdolim that passed away uh, in recent generations, hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, we had the schus, uh, two of my sons and myself, to be present in the Levaya. Yeah. Um, so I'll just say a few words uh, in his memory. Lilu uh, Nishmato. Everyone knows, speaks about his uh, tremendous uh, hatmada. He didn't waste a moment uh, of learning Torah all of his life. Uh, spent every single moment of his life learning. Uh, didn't interest him anything else. Nothing else interested him uh, at all. Uh, they say he didn't even know the names of the streets that he was walked uh, frequently uh, in Bnei Brak. Uh, from his from his home to his base medrash or shul, uh, he didn't know what's what's flying around him, uh, and yet he had this tremendous siyata uh, dishmaya. Uh, Hashem was definitely with him. Uh, the presence of the shechina around him uh, that he gave uh, so many ad- so much advice to so many people that turned to be uh, turned out to be correct. And he helped so many people with blessings and, and good advice that uh, uh, they were able to succeed in, in what they did. Um, so just a story or two that I just I heard uh, uh, during these past few days when there was speak, uh, speeches about him and eulogies. Uh, so in the eulogy at the funeral, I remember it was his son, uh, one son of his spoke at the funeral, and Rav uh, Yitzhak Zilberstein, who is his brother-in-law, uh, they were married to two sisters, both daughters of Rav Yoshiv. Uh, these huge giants uh, are all family uh, many times. So one of them said that after his father, Rav Chaim Kanevsky's father, who was a stipler, a big gadol of his own, after he passed away, Rav Chaim, in memory of his father, decided to begin a new shear, maybe Motzei Shabbat, on the Yerushalmi, uh, to teach Yerushalmi. And there's a nice crowd of people who came to listen. And they started at the beginning of the year, and they, yeah. their, their pace was four pages of Yerushalmi every Motzei Shabbat, or Dapim, double-sided, which is tremendous. A lot, a lot of work, just Motzei Shabbat. And uh, we're talking about Yerushami, which is much more difficult than the Babli. So you imagine it's learning four Dapim, let's say Shabbat of Babli, almost double the amount of effort you would need to get the Yerushami done. So that's what they did all year long. And towards the end of the year, or at the end of the year, they had succeeded to finish all of Seder Zraim, which is completely only Yerushami, except for Brachos, which we have Talmud Babli on. But all the other Masech that there's no Tami Bavli. It's completely only Yerushalmi. Pea, uh, Kilaim, Shviit, Chala, Shemotu Masrot, Masr Sheini, all these Masech that have, uh, and we know them from the Mishnayos, but in the Yerushalmi, there are actual discussions of Amoraim on these Masech that. So they were able to complete Seder Zraim, and they just began Masechet Shabbos, which is the first Masechet of Seder Moy. And then the year came to an end. So Reb Chaim said that since they started Masechet Shabbos, he can't start something without completing it. So he said he'll complete it on his own. And very quickly, in a few days, he finished that Masechet uh, of Yerushalayim himself. And he, at the end of the year, exactly, he ended the shir. He stopped the shir, he said no longer, just for that one year of the, year, of the passing of his father. So people asked him, how come? It was, it's a good shear. People want to learn the Yerushalmi, and uh, why stop the learning? After all, uh, you're adding a, an important shear due to your father. So you go on and on. So he said to them that for him, it's a waste of time because he has to prepare a little bit for teaching it. Instead of just learning it on his own, it takes a little time. He doesn't want to waste that time anymore. 
so they asked her how long it is taking to prepare the fourth the Pim of Yerushalmi for every Shmotzi Shabbos. He said five minutes. <laughs> that, that was a waste of time. <laughs> He's learning, but I guess he had to explain it to others and he had to figure out how to explain it to whereas if he's learning on his own. Rabbi Ramon wrote a long message that talked about that, about how it's good here and so it's good to be like the Dictatorial there. There's a beautiful long message from Rabbi Ramon, beautiful long email. Aha, aha, interesting. In general, in general, Not much, no, not much. Learned by himself, yeah. I was, he wrote a lot of books, tremendous amount of books, tens of books. He wrote all over the Torah, in any aspect you look at it. Uh, but he didn't give much hearing, right? Um, uh, there's another story uh, also in, in the eulogies uh, that was told that uh, he used to come home every uh, noontime after learning in the morning uh, for lunch. So his wife, the Rabbanit, who passed away 10 years ago, uh, she was also very, yeah, 10 years ago. He mentioned it at the, at the funeral also, 10 years between. Uh, she was also a tremendous tzaddikah. She also had power of blessing and, 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 and helping many, many women. So she used to have the lunch prepared and out on the table before he came in. You could eat immediately. Um, but he never started eating if she wasn't with him, sitting down at the table. He wouldn't start, wouldn't start to eat without her. It shows something about their relationship. Um, so once in a while, it turned out that she wasn't able to sit down immediately with him. She had to finish something she was doing and then ca- came to sit. So this, his son said this uh, at the funeral. His, his son said, we used to see this uh, on a daily uh, basis, that when that happened, he turned around, and behind him were some books. He grabbed a book and started learning. Now, all it took, the difference between the time when he came in and she sat down with him was a minute and a half. For a minute and a half, he couldn't without learning. So uh, it's something mind-boggling, the, 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 the tremendous uh, love for Torah and, 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 and using every moment. Um, and one last point uh, uh, say about him. Uh, Rav Ades, Rav Yaakov Ades, who's a big, big Tamil Chochem on his own, a big, besides knowing the whole Torah of the Nigla, of the revealed Torah, he also is very much in depth in, in the Kabbalistic side of Torah. Uh, Shlita is still alive. Uh, he spoke on radio, I heard him uh, Sunday morning. He said that uh, uh, he quoted a Gemara in Sanhedrin Lamed Zain. 37a, where the Gemara dis- speaks about Rabbi Zera, one of the greatest Tamoraim, Rabbi Zera, who had neighbors who were Birionim, Birione. They were uh, bad people. They were uh, gangsters, uh, misbehaved people. And, uh, but he used to always respect them and speak nicely to them, and make care of them. He, he didn't, uh, he didn't walk away from them and, and, and curse them in any way or anything of that sort. So uh, the other, ta- the other Amoraim of the generation questioned Rabbi Zera. They said that's not the proper way to treat them. If they're wicked, if they're bad people, if they're do sins and uh, bad, bad sins, you should at least stay away from them, if not curse them or, 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 or at least stay away from them. And Rabbi Zera continued his way of, of, of uh, being nice and friendly to them. When he passed away, Rabbi Zera, those bandits said to themselves, who is going to now pray for us? Who is going to care for us from now on? We don't have the great rabbi who cared for us. So they were Chazor B'tshuva. They left all their bad deeds and they became good people because uh, they didn't have anyone to rely on. So the pshat of the story is that, uh, meaning teaching us, uh, when a big gadol like this passes away, the pshat of the story is that until now, we, we were dependent on him, his Torah, his prayers, his good deeds, 
his uh, chesed tour to answer everyone and, and help everyone. Uh, so Hashem was helping the Jews due to his tremendous uh, close relationship with Hashem. Now that he's gone, it's up to us to heighten our level and uh, be more involved even than we were till now, more involved in Torah, more involved in mitzvahs, more involved in chesed than we were before. Uh, so that we fill, we fill in the vacant space that is left now in the world without him uh, existing. So that's the shot of the story that they took it upon them, took responsibility over themselves because they have no one to depend on when Rabbi Zera passed away. Or Avadis explained it even more uh, deeply in a Kabbalistic manner. He said that when we, when we fulfill Torah mitzvahs in this world, no matter how careful we are, every halacha and, and, and with kavana and content and everything, since we're after all living in a materialistic world and we're in bodies, so no matter how connected we are to our neshama, we're, we're constrained in, in, a, in a body and we're living a materialistic life. We eat, we drink, we, 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 we enjoy ourselves, we, we involved in this world. And that automatically lowers the spiritual level of the Torah mitzvahs that we fulfill in this world. They can't be 100% spiritual, 100% holy, 100% pure if they're coming from within our body. And from within normal life uh, of materialistic issues, natural stuff. The moment a, pa- a person passes away, his neshama disconnects from his body. The body stays here. The neshama goes up to heaven. The neshama takes with it all the good deeds, all the Torah, all the prayers that this person had done in this world. That's, all, that's the only thing that goes up with us. Nothing else goes up. All the rest. Al tira ki ashirish ki rebech vod beito ki lo vemoto yikach kol ered achav kvodo. Don't fear those who are wealthy and have all their wealth here in this world because they won't take any of it upstairs in the world, uh, in the after-death world. All we take up with us is our good deeds, is our, is, uh, is, is our learning, is our praying, is, is all, all our spiritual uh, actions and deeds. Yeah, oh, yeah, nice. <laughs> exactly. We have it. Okay, terrific. Yes, so can you tell They made a song out of them. Uh, there's a melody to them. So, so says Ravades, when the person goes, when the neshama of the person goes up to heaven, taking with him or her all their good deeds, all their spiritual uh, actions in this world, then they become, now they become pure, holy, 100% spiritual, because now they're not constrained in a body. There's no longer the physical aspect of life to lower the spirituality of these deeds. So they uh, sort of uh, reignite up in heaven to be 100, 1,000%, 100% holy and complete in the upper world. And then they shine down to us with tremendous holiness, with tremendous uh, spirituality uh, to our living, to this existing world, because now they have become much, much more pure. So the light in them that exists in them is much stronger and it beams down to this world to give us more connection to Hashem. So we benefit, according to this idea, deep Kabbalistic idea, we benefit from a tzaddik more after his death than while he's alive. Because while he's alive, after all, even though no matter how tzaddik he is or she is, they're inside the body. and They're living in this materialistic world. So it lessens the purity of everything. Up in the next world, they take those same deeds and they become completely pure and then they beam down on us with Tremendous uh, holiness, purity, and that's and that's how we gain from living here in this world. So 
That's maybe the reason that we say tzadikim emotam nikiru chayim. After their death, they're considered alive, uh, not physically, of course. We don't hold like some some do <laughs> that someone never died, uh, but uh, spiritually, after their death, that's their real life now. That's when they're really living a real life now, they're completely holy, and all their deeds get a new. Uh, get extra strength, spiritual strength in what they have done. Uh, and that's what made the neighbors of Rabbi Zera Hoza B'tshuva. And after he passed away, all of his prayers and all of his good deeds towards them and, and learning Torah all, all, all the time beamed down on them much stronger, had greater influence on them much more than when he was alive. And that's why they were Hoza B'tshuva. So anyway, we look at it. Uh, uh, it's something that we gain either again by uh, believing in the fact that uh, we have, uh, uh, that we have to take over and fill in the empty, uh, uh, the emptiness that was, that, that was caused by uh, this great rabbi uh, leaving us, or by the fact that he himself, from up in heaven, his deeds are beaming down on us and making us holier and, and or pure and more uh, connected with Hashem, and we have to then live up to it and uh, use, utilize his, this, this purity that we gain after his death. Yes? Quick question. Yeah. At the funeral, someone said that he asked Hashem like to give up brachos, but when he said he took his time to learn, he didn't want to spend. He took his bracha, bracha the hazlacha. Right, made it bua. And he made a brachy table. Bua, bua. That, that was famous. I myself experienced it. You go by, it says bua, and you continue. Bua is bracha v'atzlacha. Right. You didn't have time to say bracha v'atzlacha. It's just some, it's, you can't fathom such a, that's a person. And by the way, mentioning that, um, uh, I, I saw in some, I think it was written somewhere, or I heard it on the radio. I must have heard in the radio, uh, maybe what's his Shabbos. Um, Someone asked him, uh, how come you say full, the full two words of Rufuah Shleima? Now you didn't abbreviate into Rufush. You could have said Rufush, Rufuah Shleima. <laughs> Very common abbreviation. Bua isn't a common abbreviation of Bracha Vatzlacha. When you write some, when you write Bracha Vatzlacha, you write it out. Dafka Rufuah Shleima, you do write Rufush. Many times uh, you do shorten the term when you're writing. So how come we didn't do that? So he said, the answer is, Based on the words we say, refua shlema. So it has to be complete. So you have to say the words completely, full words. Bracha vatzlacha doesn't say there's shalem, shlema. So you can say an abbreviation. And so he had everything calculated exactly. Uh, all right, then I, actually, I will say one more story, which is really unbelievable. It's, it was a known story. It wasn't the first time I heard it, but in the eulogy of, uh, it's like Zilberstein said this brother-in-law, uh, and he reported it to Rabbi Yoshev. He says Rabbi Yoshev couldn't get over it. He said that's only in the Rishonim period can this, such a thing happen. He said that uh, the story went that Rabbi Chaim Kanievsky studied uh, in depth the issue of uh, grasshoppers, chagavim, locusts. Uh, is it, can we eat them? Can we not eat them? We have the tradition, the Yemenite tradition is to eat some, some, one, one of the types of Hagavim, and they have them for, for lunch, <laughs> but uh, uh, most of us don't. Uh, we're not sure of the, which ones are kosher, which ones aren't kosher. So he went into de- in depth into understanding all the uh, issues with, behind uh, the kashas of Hagavim. And he came to a question that he couldn't figure out something dependent on the way it looks on the grasshopper itself, the way the structure of the body is. He wasn't able to make out something uh, in the, from the Gemara, what it should look like uh, on the actual body of the Chagav. So as, 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 he's, as he's thinking and trying to make out the understanding of the Gemara, suddenly a grasshopper lands on his, on his porch. Amash, in front of him, lands on his porch. They catch it. They show it to him, uh, what it looks like, and then he answers the que- he, had a, he had an answer to the question. But else she said, only in the days of Rishon, there's a Tosfos that quotes in the days of the Ria Kadosh, one of the Bali, great Balea Tosfos, 
that similar thing happened to the re that he was question he wasn't sure about some the build of the build of a of a of a bird of some type if it's uh, kosher or not so that bird suddenly landed near him to be able to see how it's how it's built so only the days of Rishon can such things happen definitely a very and the very last point is that Chaim Kanievsky for the last few years has been speaking about Mashiach time. That he said, he said it's coming very, very, very close, very near. He even encouraged many times over and over again, who'll start its people, start packing up and come quickly because it's very soon. That's what he used to say to every Chutzad's person that came to him. When he asked him, where do you live? He said, Chutzad, he says, pack up and come. It's really close. Well, he wants to take him shopping with <laughs> Very nice. It's true. true. Yeah, the 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 Chavitz Chaim had famously the Chavitz Chaim had a suitcase. Yeah, but that wasn't good look. Now we're right, in right, now. right. Oh, there's a, 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 a wow. <laughs> Tough Miriam, the drums of Miriam. Yeah, I said that. Yeah, with the reed. With the reed, that was the story of the reed, the ballet tosmos. That he got the same uh, service, Hashem served, he gave the same service of the bird that he was questioning. Yeah, it was a bird or something. Chicken or bird. The reed, reaction. Anyhow, um, so we're hoping uh, that's true, the Mashiach is coming. And Rabbi Phil Malka, when he was interviewed Friday afternoon after it happened, uh, he first said, no, he said it afterwards, but it doesn't matter the order. He said that everyone has to tear Kriya. We're hearing uh, the passing of Chaim Konevsi because he's like the father of all of us. So it's like, uh, have you like, us, like a father passing away? Uh, I didn't see too many that did that. I saw in, uh, at the funeral itself, I did see one fellow who had his shirt torn. Uh, from he did Korea? Yeah. Wow. 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 Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> you saw it happening. Yeah. Anyway, that's one point. But then Fimaka said that since he was so uh, conscientious, conscientious and uh, and um, certain, sure of the fact that it's getting very close to the Mashiach. So he said, or Fimaka said that uh, Chaim Kanevsky was left this world in order to call him God, went to call him Mashiach. So we're hoping that's the that's the result of all this, and we'll be gladly uh, happy to receive him. Right. And the big gadol is going to pass away, and then the Mashiach will come. That's Rabbi Pinto. Rabbi Pinto said that. It's actually recorded on video. You see the video, him speaking and saying that a year or two ago. <laughs> it wasn't uh, yesterday. What? Around the time when Corona started. I guess right before. A few years ago, he said that. And even, I think, an earthquake uh, he mentioned also. Oh, we, had we had we had a few of them, right? All right Small right. ones, so yeah. But all this, and he said then, I, I heard the recording, I saw him saying it, from uh, Morocco, the one is in Morocco now? No, 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 no. No, that's not him. That's, uh, it's, re it's a relative of his, but... Yeah, could be. No, no, no. He came from France. No, yeah. not this one. No, it's a different Pinto. He used to live in Israel and got something got mixed up there with the. Something got mixed up. It's not a good story uh, to leave Israel, but uh, from Morocco, he's, he's making a. He, he's leading from Morocco. He's leading tens of thousands of Jews now. He has his Bate Midrash, they call them, Ohev Israel, I believe. He's opening them. They're opening them all over the world under his uh, leadership. He's still saying things. And yeah, I don't know exactly who he is or what he is, but 
We're ready no matter what. Okay. Um, so let's continue with the uh, tefillah. Okay. So, you know, let, let's do tefillah a second because it's still on the more machshavat uh, side of things. And then we'll go to the halachic side, halachic topics, and then we'll hear a question about Kiddush. Uh, just uh, we'll do this short because we spoke about Rukhaim so much. Um, uh, we were at actually Kibbutz Geluyot, the Bracha we were talking about, which connects very well. Um, we had mentioned Kabe Shafar Gadol Echiruteinu. We explained the, I think we said we'll explain it this time. Uh, what the meaning of Gadol means. Uh, what's the point of First of all, I'm not sure, do we say this? The blowing of the shofar itself, what does that mean? That will begin the gula process? We say, uh, if we did, so we'll repeat it. If we didn't, so we'll learn a bit, learn a bit now. That the shofar doesn't necessarily have to mean that there's going to be a sound of the blowing of a shofar like we hear in the Rosh Hashanah. doesn't mean that the whole world we'll stop when, the, when we'll hear a, a, a tremendous blowing of a shofar by Hashem, by the Mashiach, by Eliyahu. Doesn't mean necessarily so. Uh, Rav Cook explains this as the awakening call of Hashem. Doesn't mean that it's going to be a sound that we hear. It's from within. The fact that we are awakened in the, these past few generations to return to our homeland the word nes here does not mean miracle. Does not mean miracle. It means a flag, right? Like a like, uh, very tall uh, uh, flag or uh, in, the, um, in the ships. You have the torin. You know, it's a, what's that? What's Mast, right. Thank you. Right. Mask. Yeah. Right, which is very high, and then everyone knows where the ship is and uh, see the direction. So here also it means that uh, there's gonna they're gonna be leaders that will lead the Jewish people back to their homeland. Have everyone aware of the fact that time has come to leave Galut and come live in Israel. So the shofar is this internal feeling, emotion, that eagerness that, start, that starts building up in people's hearts to leave Galut and start and, and, and come back to Eretz Israel. That's the shofar. That's, that's the, feel, the, the, the blowing of Hashem to tell us, come back home. Unfortunately, not everyone feels this. It, it doesn't have to happen all at once. It happens step by step. Some heard it very early in, in time, some much later, and some haven't yet. But uh, it's a process. You is a long process. Uh, it says in the book of Yeshayahu, the opposite of the Gulat Mitzrayim, coming out of Egypt, where it says, Bechipazon, ki Bechipazon tetzeu. Then Hashem did everything for us. We did not do a thing to be redeemed from Egypt, not spiritually. And not physically. We weren't worthy of the Gula back in the days of Egypt because we had we weren't fulfilling mitzvot. We didn't even see the Torah yet. Uh, the angels speak about Am Israel and the Egyptians. Why should these, why should the Jews be saved from to have this before the splitting of the sea? Why should the sea split for the Jews and drown the Egyptians? They're both of the Avadazara, both nations. So uh, we were far from being spiritually connected. And physically, we didn't do a thing. Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron uh, led the way and, 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 and created the uh, 10 plagues. Hashem did them, of course. They were a little bit involved. The Jews didn't do a thing. And the spring of the sea, nothing. Hashem ilachem lachem. Ve'atem tacharishun. You just stay quiet. Be quiet. Hashem will do everything for you. So that's bechipazon. The chipazon is when Hashem does everything, so it's in a second. 
So I can decide in one second that all Egyptians die, drown or die or have plagues and all that. And the second later, I'm Israel are free to go. Now it's, if Hashem, if Hashem does everything, there's no time barrier. There's no need for a process. But when we do it, when the Geulah comes by us being involved, like we are in this present Geulah, the Geulah Shlishit, so it takes time because human beings, uh, there's a whole need to develop, develop the process. Uh, politics, the, 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 the wars, uh, the, the gathering, the, the need for a, for a strong uh, uh, army and a strong uh, um, uh, financial situation. It all takes time. So it's a long process if it's done by uh, diplomatic uh, steps done by human beings. So that's why Yeshayahu, already back then, uh, more than 2,500 years ago, Shayao the prophet already said that the final Gula, he said, Lo will not be quick, it will be slow, it will be a whole process. So that's the shofar, the blowing of the shofar is the awakening of the Jews to come back to return to their homeland. And the gadol, again, obviously, if we're not talking about an actual shofar, so what does gadol here mean? It doesn't mean a big shofar, a long shofar. So it's based on, again, Rav Cook explains this. Uh, we may have mentioned all this, so uh, if yes, so it's just to review quickly. I don't remember. I remember if just, uh, vaguely uh, speaking about this, but not sure in this in this class. Um, that Rav Cook speaks about three different ways of gathering back to our homeland: shofar pasul tame from a chayat mea from a non-kosher animal, which is a shofar pasul. And then there's shofar kasher, but it's not the mehadrin type, which is all the kosher animals. Besides a cow, that's not kosher to use the, the cow's horn for as a shofar, but all the rest of the kosher animals are kosher to use for a shofar. And there's mitzvah in a muvchar, the most mehadrin shofar, which is the ram. The shofar of the ram. Uh, the ail. Of, uh, resembling Akedas, reminding us of Akedas Yitzchak, of the ayah that uh, Avram slaughtered instead of Yitzchak, and that's the best show for So Rav Kook says, these three represent three different ways of leaving Galus. The shofar Tame is the fact that people are driven out, that the Jews are finding it so difficult to stay where they are, anti-Semitism, pogroms, wars, uh, financial uh, difficult, great difficulties. For those reasons, they're driven out of those lands, that they're, of those countries, and they decide to come to live in Israel. So that's one way of returning to our homeland. Another way, and that's the least uh, best way, but it's okay too. After all, it works. We're here. But it's the least best way. Um, which I think he mentions there that bidiavad, if you have no other choice, bidiavad, even a shofar from a non-kosher animal, bidiavad, uh, you would say the mitzvah. It's not kosher lechatchila, but it's bidiavad, okay. And then the next way of, of, of returning back to our homeland is when people gather because of national reasons. They want a homeland for the Jews to live together and not be scattered all over the world. That's the Zionist movement, not necessarily religious, not religious or anti-religious Zionist movement, which decided that Herzl and others, that we need a homeland to be secure and to have our own tradition and uh, language and customs and live together as a people. They didn't care so much if it was in Israel or somewhere else. Yanda or anyone else, as long as we're con congregated together, living as a people all together. So that's for a national reason. So that's more, more kosher than being driven out, having, having to flee away. But it's not yet the top, top situation, uh, top, top uh, reason to come to return back to our homeland, but it's a little bit higher. So that's why it's the Shofar Kasher. It's from kosher animals. 
but it's not the top, top reason. The top, top reason is when Jews return to their homeland because of Hashem's commandment. Because they know Hashem wants us to live here because it's a great mitzvah. Out of holiness. You feel the holiness of the land. So you'll be driven by fulfilling Torah mitzvahs. That's, that's the greatest, best reason to come to return to our homeland, like many of you have done. Oh, Hashem. And uh, that's the Shafar Gadol. The Katan is the first one, Benoni is the second, and Gadol is the third. So we're asking of Hashem, please lead us to our homeland by the top reason, top level of returning to our homeland, which is for your sake, Hashem, to fulfill your mitzvah of Yeshu Eretz Israel and accomplishing all the mitzvot in a much better form, much higher form than can be accomplished in the Chutzarts by living here in Israel. So we're asking for, from Hashem that this should be the the process of the Gula. Of course, we'll accept other ways as well. And the Shev will accept other ways as well, but we prefer, we much prefer that it comes out of uh, divine, uh, re- divine reason, a holy reason, and not the others. Uh, and by the way, uh, uh, my son sent me yesterday, last night, uh, a piece of, uh, uh, of a book of Rav Shlomo Avinir, a quote from Avshalom Avinir's book called Eretz Chaim. And there, he, Rav Avinir quotes some questions that he had asked Rav Chaim Kanievsky, uh, rega- issues regarding Eretz Israel. It's very interesting. Of course, his answers are very short. One word, maximum two words. That's how he answers all, his question, all the questions he was, he was asked. So um, one of the questions there was, is it better to be a ra- who, who, who is at a higher level? A rabbi that learns Torah and teaches Torah and observes all mitzvot on the highest level possible in Chutzlaret or a simple Jew living in Israel? That's what Rabbi Kanevsky was asked. Which is at a higher level? He said the Jew living in Israel. He said the Be'eretz Yisrael. That was it. In Ketubot, you mean? The last, uh, the end of Ketubot? Right, it's not exactly a Mishnah, it's, in the, it's a quote from Ketubot, the last page of Ketubot, Kuf Yud, Kuf Yud Aleph. Right, that last was second, right. Yeah, but uh, to, hear, to hear literally, literally regarding this exact question, point from Chaim Kanevsky is special as well. You're right, it's based on, that's where he takes it from. He doesn't, he doesn't make it up, he doesn't make up. Allahos, he takes it from there, right? Yeah, makes you nervous. <laughs> Yeah. Sure. Okay, sure. Definitely. Gladly. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so there should be the, this flag, this leader, leadership that will ga- gather our people back to our homeland. It's a little different, Mr. Hashim, Mr. Sfar, but it's almost the same wording. Uh, that we should gather all together quickly from all corners, four corners of the world, to our country. Now, the, I think the most important word in this bracha is the word yachad. Some people would say mehira. Some people would say uh, the shofar gadol that we spoke about before. I think the most important word of this whole bracha is kabtzenu yachad. Nusach Hashkin, as you don't say Mehira even. You don't say Laratzenu. You just say Mekabatzenu. Yachad, Merabak, and Potaharetz. But the Yachad is crucial. Crucial. Because without us, no matter how much we get, gather back to our homeland, and how many Jews come back here, if we're not united, if we can't tolerate one another, and accept that there are different views, as we've said many, many, many times, then the whole Gula will fall apart. It's not gonna. It's not gonna develop into something real and good. We found that in Bayit Sheni. Bayit Sheni, they weren't yachad. So no matter no matter how many 
how much holiness there was there in Beit HaMikdash and, and, and the Hashmonaim and, and, and Hashem Nesis Agdola and the Nevim and whoever was there in the Bayit Shani. But the fact that they were had Sinas Chino amongst them and the Natsiv in the beginning of and his inter- introduction to Sefer Bereshi speaks about the fact that within the religious circles there was Sinas Chino. We're not talking about between the Prushim and the Tznukim and the Baitasim and the Isim, all those groups which were more like the reforms, conservatives, and orthodox today. We're not talking about between those different, different groups. We're talking about within the orthodox community, within the Prushi. That's when the fighting was so terrible that if one did something a little different than the other, then he was considered kofir. You're not you're, you're out of the game. You're out of the... I know, we're having the same issues today. Very, very difficult. We hope that it's not as bad as it used to be then. We hope we learned some lesson from uh, 2,000 years ago, but it's still a lot to work on. Uh, I'll just mention one thing that so, it hurts me so much. Uh, from Zalman Melamed of the Yeshiva's Beitel, the Rosh Yeshiva Beitel, the father of Velezer Melamed, due to the corona, he, he awakened to the fact that uh, we're two separate one from another. It, it dawned on him that that may be the message that Hashem is trying to send us. And therefore, around a year ago, he came out with four letters, one after the other, writing to all the religious Zionist rabbis. Religious Zionists, we're not even talking about Haredi and, uh, and Chilonim or anything else. Religious Zionist rabbi, not even, not even talking about the people. The closest that can be to get to, with the togetherness uh, of appreciating one another and, and respecting one another, he wrote to them a, a few letters speaking about the fact that we must unite. This is the, the that's the message of Shemit trying to send us by the corona. We must come together. We must respect each other. We must listen to, listen to each other. We don't have to accept views that we don't believe in, but, but be tolerant and be respectful and, and listen to what other people have to say. And he came up with this uh, uh, sort of to build an, uh, a Muta organization around this point and to connect as many rabbis as he could to this. And they had conventions and all that. And uh, Personally, uh, uh, it fits very well my views uh, uh, many years already of what should be. So I joined the, the group and uh, I suggested to the organizers who are uh, under his uh, leadership, who are the actual organizers of all, of all the events and all the uh, ways to, to create ways to connect, I suggested to them that we can work more specifically within towns, within cities like to have all the rabbis of Ranana, and if you want to also to connect to Farsaba and Ertzalia, the areas nearby, all the rabbis once a month, once in two months, once in three months, meet together and discuss all kinds of topics and listen to each other, one another, what each one has to say, and try to create some unified message to the, uh, within that city uh, that, they're, that they live in. Which was done, by the way, wasn't my idea. It was done, by the way, by Rav Beller, Zichonoli Bracha, Chief Te. He used to do. He used to organize such meetings between rabbis. Uh, quite a few that uh, I was I had the schus to attend. So they they liked the idea, and they're starting to try to spread it all over the country to have these small towns come together. And uh, what's very painful is that within the Zohar Merkaz, which is quite a large area, now I've been talking about a Sharon, the Zohar Merkaz, many, many cities, turns out that the organizers, they asked me for names of rabbis who I think would be uh, keen and, 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 and would like to be involved in, and, and be part of these types of meetings. I gave them a few names, but they have much larger spectrum and scale of, of rabbis to, 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 to contact and, be, and reach out to. And uh, the main organizer of all this got back to me a few weeks ago saying that he could only find seven rabbis that are willing, what's that? In the Zohar Merkaz, they're willing to spend time of their 
busy schedule to spend time to meet, just as the committee to create the smaller me town meetings between rabbis, to be on the committee to create in each town uh, uh, these types of meetings with rabbis, only seven in the entire zone of El and even that's so difficult to get all seven, Baruch Hashem, I'm one of those seven, to get us to sit together in this one, one, one evening or uh, one location and speak to each other. Uh, very sad because this should be the number one issue that, that rabbis, at least rabbis, if not all the congregations and all the people should be so, should be going strongly on this point and uh, making it work and happen. So that's the Kabutzenu Yachad, Merabak and Fota Aretz. Not enough to be, to be gathered in our homeland. We have to also be all together and, and, and unite as one nation. As we've said all many, many times, the final line after the bracha is in present tense, not future tense. And this was said 200, 500, 1,000, 2,000 years ago. You were saying all the years. Which means that Hashem is forever leading the world to kibbutz galuyot. Sometimes, many years, we didn't see, we didn't feel that this was the process. But even in those times, difficult times when things were going the opposite of kibbutz galuyot, it was part of kibbutz galuyot. Because Hashem was always trying to awaken us in different ways and different leaders and different events and different problems and situations, always trying to make, awaken us to get us back to our homeland. It just took 2,000 years for us to realize this. Okay, so that's with this bracha. Um, yeah, this time we spent uh, a lot of time because of Rechaim Kaneski, which I think it was important to uh, take, uh, learn lessons from this giant uh, rabbi. Um, so, Rifi's question about Kiddush, uh, because I did want to finish uh, the chapter on Brachos, but uh, it's going to take more than five minutes. So, maybe I'll take Rifi's question on Kiddush, and we'll do the last section of the chapter we're in in Brachos. We'll do it next time, and after that, we'll ju it'll just take us a few minutes uh, we just have uh, 10, 15 minutes of discussion for Brachos of that chapter that we were at to sequence uh, the order, right order between the different Brachos. And then Bezat Hashem, we'll, we'll do a few. Next week already, we'll start with Samechos Pesach. We'll try to get in as much as we can towards Pesach. As it says, 30 days before Pesach, to start learning about Pesach. So we'll do a few Lachos. You can't manage to do too much uh, in this short. Uh, so a time we're together every week, but we'll do as much as we can. And after Pesach, we'll continue the Hilchus Brachos uh, uh, next chapter in the book. Okay, yes, there's a Kiddush question. Uh, including Raviz, at least, right? You, oh, you have, meaning... You don't fill up the cup because you have less grape juice than you can to fill the cup. So the first question, I'll repeat the question again for the Zoom uh, ladies. Um, uh, the question is double question about Kiddush. Firstly, we know that we're supposed to have at least the amount of a revise, which as we said many times, 81 cc, which is half of a, an average regular disposable plastic cup. That's the amount of revise. And by the way, we're supposed to have that amount in the cup we can drink enough to drink milologmat. We can drink the majority of that amount and still be out sick. Better if you drink the whole revis, but we can definitely drink enough is to drink milologmat, uh, which is rov revit. So it's uh, more than 40 cc. 81 was revit, so 42, 43 cc. That would be milologmat in average. It's actually the one cheekful for every person. Specifically, individually, 
but uh, in average, it's around 45, uh, 43 uh, cc. That would be enough to drink. Uh, so the question was, what happens if you don't have enough grape juice or wine to fill up a revit to begin with, to say Kiddush over? I'll even complicate the question. Let's say you do have Belologma. You have the amount of Belologma, you have 45 cc, you just don't have 81. And we just said now that it's enough to drink 45 cc out of the revit that you have to begin with. So is that enough to have from the, from the beginning? The answer is no. You must have revis of wine. That's the minimum, minimum, minimum. Without that, you can't make kiddush over. No. Now you can, you can by using other drinks because we have what's called chemar medina. We're allowed to make kiddush on beer, on no other drinks there. No, you cannot add water to grape juice, no, because that becomes, what's that? Not just whiskey or wine. You can have fruit juice, sque uh, uh, 100% squeezed fruit juice of any type. That's also Chemal Medina. You can have beer, black beer, white beer. You can have um, uh, milk. Even milk is considered Chemal Medina. Or uh, coffee or tea is problematic because it's hot and then you can't drink it at once. That you can't use, but all those types of drinks and beverages are considered uh, important so you can make it a over. Adding water to your grape juice, if it were wine, that would have been okay. Adding water to wine would be okay to fill up the amount that you need, providing for Ashkenazim, it needs to still remain 16.666% actual wine from grapes. All the rest could be water. For Sephardim, it has to be 51% of the uh, grape uh, coming from the grape, the wine part, and the 49% could be water. That's why, by the way, Ravadi Yosef, it was actually seen uh, at, at a wedding. He was at a wedding. He was the officiator. And they gave him a wine. He looks at it. He pours, uh, he pours into the cup. And when they get to, the, to saying the bracha, he says, <laughs> That's what he says when he drinks it there. Which is, by the way, Yotze, with those beverages that we just spoke before, about before, Yotze, by Chopa as well. Even by Chopa, your Yotze, even if it's not Chema Medina. For example, not actual, not just water, but if you have a Coke or a Kinley or any of the uh, Prigat type, which are a lot of water, not 100% squeezed fruit juice, your yotze by, by, by chupa with those as well, not by kiddish. By kiddish, you need chemal medina. By chupa, it's even enough to have one of those. So, uh, but those, since they're mainly water and they just get uh, flavored, Coke and the Kindly and the Sprite are mainly water and just get some flavoring, that's not chemal medina. It's not an important beverage uh, yeah, you can serve chemal medina. 81 cc, you cannot make Kiddush if you don't have any of these beverages. Oh, okay. Now that's the next point. Let's say you have a big cup, but you can't, you don't have enough to fill up the cup. Oh, wait, so one second, one second. I'm just going to finish the point that to wine, you can add some water to fill up the cup. To grape juice, you cannot because grape juice is squeezed it's like any other squeezed juice from, from, from a fruit. And that, the moment you add some water, even a little bit of water, not two, three drops, I'm talking about a little bit of water, significant amount, but very little, already automatically that takes away from the importance of, of it being grape juice. Uh, no, but you know what? Sorry, this, uh, I'm sorry, this still works. It still works. Oh, no, wait. So we spoke about... Because, no, the point is that it becomes shahako. The moment you add a little bit of amount of water, not drop or two, but a little bit of water to your grape juice, according to Rav Shlomo Zavin and Rav Yoshim, they both hold the same, that it becomes shahako. Because it's no longer grape juice. It's like water with some taste. No, there isn't. In the grape juice, 
And gracious is 100% gracious. And the ones we buy with a good hechshen. There may be some that aren't. You have to be careful. There might maybe some with water. I, I, re I remember someone showing me in the men's, uh, by the men's shear, someone showed us on Zoom, they showed us the uh, tag on it, where it said, the label on it, where it says 70% grape juice and the rest water. And it says it, and it says on the Hechsher, Kasher le Kiddush, le Fiavet Yosef, and everything else, which is wrong. I don't remember the company, but you have to be very, you have to be aware. It has to say 100% grape juice on it. Otherwise, it's Shehakol. Now, it's a Shehakol of an important beverage because after all, it's mainly grapes 70%, 80% grape juice. So it could still be considered Chema Medina good enough to make your kiddush over it, but you have to say shahako, not very prayer like you would say for beer and for 100% squeezed uh, fruit juice. Say shahakol, and you can make kiddush over that. Say shahakol, and then in the whole kiddush, the whole. Even if it has a light version. If it has water in it, then no, right? I don't know. You have to check the check the ingredients. Right. Yeah, because the grapes themselves are uh, sweet. Uh, usually, you don't need to add sugar. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, the normal one adds in, and, which doesn't. It's not necessary. Yeah. Anyway, to uh, wow. <laughs> okay, so that's fine. Anyway, uh, so now the question uh, Rifki asked about having uh, not enough in the cup, right? Uh huh. Okay, anyhow. So the, uh, we'll just finish with this point that if you don't have enough to fill up the cup, you definitely can still make Kiddush over such a cup, even if it's not fully uh, full. Because uh, if you're having the Ravit amount of Ravit in the cup and even drinking from it, the Lologmav, that's enough. We care about the content and not the filling up of the cup. It's much nicer if you do fill the cup because it's more respectful towards Hashem that you serve it with a full cup. But if you don't have enough, you're still able to make Kiddush. That doesn't cancel your possibility to make Kiddush over it, as long as you have the uh, proper amount of 81 cc. That's definitely fine to make Kiddush over that. Yeah. And by the way, mentioning Pesach, I'll just say one last point. What's that? Better yet, yes. Better yet to find a smaller cup so that you do fill the cup with what you have. That's better. Because it's more respectful towards the Shem to come with a full cup not, and not being not, stingy like not. that. It is important, but it's not makiv. It's not, uh, doesn't it cancel, not cancel the No, no. Kiddush, the minimum Kiddush could be only over a mozi, only, only packed. And only during the night Kiddush, not the daytime Kiddush. Night Kiddush, if you don't have... Uh, the nighttime kiddush, if you don't have wine, the second best is dafka the chala, and not the chemal medina, whereas in the daytime kiddush, it's only chemal medina. That can work for you, you can't use the chala, because anyway, it's a mozi. There's no kiddush there. So, um, yeah, so using two chalot and washing before, you wash, you say, then you go to your chala, you say the entire kiddush, in the middle you say, it's a mozi and not, of course, and then when you finish the whole kiddush, that's when you eat from the mat, from the mechala. Just one last point mentioning all this on Pesach, as we're thirty days before now, so it's good to mention on Pesach we have right less than thirty days within thirty days um, on Pesach where uh, we should be drinking the entire cup, not even not even full revis. Versus melolog mab, yeah. So try to get the smaller cup, the smallest cup possible that still includes a full revise, of course. Can't have less than a revise. 
There, it's not even enough to have a lolo gmar. By Pesach, you have to have the full release. But if you have a cup that's larger than that, and you should fill up your cup because of being respectful towards Hashem, so there, so as much as you've got in the cup, that's how much you have to drink. You could live a little, leave a little bit in the end, but it's in Pesach, we have this idea of filling up, the, of, of, of drinking the full cup. Arba Kosot is drinking the full four cups that we have. So it's better to get this smallest size or closest smallest size of a revise, and then you're just drinking what you need to drink is a revise. I drink too much more of that because we know it's difficult to consume so much uh, within one night and all the other food and everything else. Okay, I just noticed that there's a chat here. Ah, yes, so the chala, right, Carol asked about the chala. That's true, we said that, that it's uh, even better than chemal medina in the nighttime kiddush. To use the chala, make kiddush over chala. And if not, then chemal medina, then those special uh, uh, drinks, uh, beverages that, uh, that are important, then use that. Okay. Take care. Have a good week. Ah, for concentrate. No, that's called Meshukhzar. That could be. That could be okay, because what they do is... Exactly. They dried it out, and then you're adding the water to replace. Yeah, but best to have the normal grape juice squeezed from the Grapes, right? Okay, Shavuot Tov, everyone, and Salat Tovot. Shavuot Tov, thank you very much. Very welcome. Bye.